All right, it's Tuesday, and we're back with the Curse of Politics special delayed cabinet edition of the Curse of Politics. I'm here with Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed, who've spent all day on CTV commentating on this. We'll see if they have anything left to say about <laughs> the new cabinet on this show. Jenny, Scott, how are you? Very good. Very good, stupid. David. How are you? I'm stupid. I'm really stupid. <laughs> For the people watching CTV today, you know how stupid I am. Uh, Joyce Murray was just appointed a cabinet. Turns out she's been there for six years. Uh, New Brunswick was Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia was New Brunswick. Who the fuck could tell the difference? If you're this stupid, I just mix them up. So, yeah, I'm a real cracker jack. Super duper fine, sharply minded analysis. <laughs> so you've done you've done a little work between CTV and here because this is a serious, it's a serious show. Well, I've familiarized myself with the map of Canada, so that helps. I feel stronger, right. <laughs> stronger position to carry the conversation now. Fucking moron that I am. I thought Jeanette Petipaw Taylor was in Nova Scotia. Jenny's frantically sending me messages offline. Wrong province. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they should have had Jenny on more. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> is she only. Is she, she only got five chances to say, Gibo is not to be trusted. <laughs> Keep your eye on that fucker. I think he's French. <laughs> Jenny, you asked me how I am. I'm wearing my Rough Rider shirt today because I'm going to be, courtesy of our friends at the Bistro. Hey. I'm going to be sitting in the owner's box in Molson Stadium on Saturday for the Saskatchewan Montreal Alouette football game, and I'm too polite a guy to wear my Rough Rider gear into the owner's box of the Montreal Alouette, so I'll be wearing something neutral. So today, I had to represent. Well, that's very good, and that's very nice of you. Cindy's, uh, shout out to Cindy Stern from the Bistro. Cindy's brother, Gary, the owner of the of, of the Alouettes, also invited me and the boys uh, when they played here in Toronto, and we went. And I similarly... Uh, chicken dad, I'm wearing my rider's garb. I just uh, showed up, uh, you know, kind of. <laughs> I mean, I have the perfect jersey. I could wear my half Montreal Canadiens, half Saskatchewan Rough Riders jersey, which would be perfect, except not in the owner's box. Yeah. 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 Okay. So there was a cabinet shuffle today. Not a shuffle. There was a new cabinet. Why are we calling it a shuffle? Brand new cabinet formed today for the new Trudeau government. Let's start off our conversation with this broad thing. Is this a status quo cabinet or a change cabinet, Jenny? Um, I think it's a change cabinet. You have some people that 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 stayed in in their positions. Guys like Lawrence McCauley stayed at uh, Vets. Uh, Diane, I would say her name, Le Boutelier, uh, she stayed at yeah. uh, uh, Revenue Canada. But it was a change. It was pretty much a change cabinet. There was a lot. This was this was definitely more change than what we saw when they came in in 2019. It was actually surprisingly, but surprising when they came in in 2019, they made a lot fewer changes than what a government would be after four uh, four years. So this was a change. This this seemed though that Trudeau uh, decided he sat down and he said, "You know what I'm going to do now? I've won a third term, and I am going to fucking hang around with my friends uh, for the remaining time that I'm." <laughs> Prime Minister, I am going to put the people I like the most, the people I have gone to school with, whoever I've shared a beer with. Um, I have decided I am going to uh, enjoy uh, the, the last, uh, uh, my last term as Prime Minister, and pick uh, all the people that I like the best and will be least likely to say uh, no or put up their hand and say, uh, "Sorry, sir, you might be wrong here." All right, all right, Scott, change cabinet, status quo cabinet. Uh, I think it's status quo with one big exception. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously people move around. You couldn't have a new cabinet without uh, different faces and different change. Uh, but the uh, the core elements of it uh, remain the same with the exception, I think, of energy policy, climate policy. Uh, I think that's where we're going to see change. I think that this, I, like, I think the story of this cabinet, to be honest, is um, is Quebec, climate, and clique. Right. As Jenny says, it's a bit cliqueish, right? I want like I got Freelands. She's I already told you before, like she's going nowhere, right? Like we can get to the others and the rest of the shit, right? But like she's staying. You told us that two weeks ago or three weeks ago, whatever, right? And you got Dom, right? Longtime friend, guy's unbelievably 
resourceful. You can put him anywhere, have anything with him. So he wants him nice and close. Julie co-chairs the campaign. She's cracked the inner circle. She's now on the tiniest orbit, right? So she's part of that little compact. So she's in there. So very cliquey. But then you look at it like overall, he wants to, I think this tells you that he thinks again that his majority runs through Quebec. And the next election, I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't think this is about him, like, you know, taking a bath. I think that he wants to win. And I think he's saying, like, I'm bolstering Quebec. I've got, I'm keeping Champagne and a big economic portfolio. I'm moving Jolie into foreign affairs. I'm putting Gibo in the front window ad environment. I'm bringing in this uh, Senage woman who looks interesting and cool. And it would be something nice to have some cool going on, right? So, like, it's just, it's Duclos. They're, you know, going to take over health. So, really, if you look at it, like, it's a, it, it, they've really stacked it, Quebec heavyweight. And, and then I think, you know, um, clearly with Guy Beau, Wilkinson moves to natural resources, meaning that natural resources is now going to be an instrument of climate policy. Guy Beau, Ecotere, hardcore driver. Um, I think they're signaling that they intend to move hard. They intend to move fast, and they're not going to blink on climate policy. So that's I, I, that's where I think the change is going to come. I think we're going to see an atypical for this government uh, urgency on climate policy and implementing stuff. And uh, and I think it's going to be um, I think it's going to be interesting to watch because implicit in that is that there's going to be some conflict. But it'll be interesting to there's see what that. Big... Sorry, go ahead. David. I was going to say, Jenny, that is to me the big story of the cabinet is the climate change. I'm going to broaden it a little bit from you, Scott, because I think there's a little bit more complexity to it when you ask. So first of all, big promotion for Gilbo and an activist, not a politician who's an environmentalist, but an activist. Okay. Then you put Wilkinson, who's an environmentalist, into NRCAN. So as you said, NRCAN, they obviously decided to eliminate whatever tension existed in the government between NRCAN and climate change. Uh, Seamus O'Regan, when he was on the Hurley Burley, laid out some of that tension and sounded like a guy that was somewhat defending the interests of uh, oil and gas in the country. Um, and obviously talked himself out of that job. I mean, frankly, he was demoted. Talk about click. He was demoted. Yeah, I um, thought that too. And I was disappointed because I, I got a lot of time for him, especially after your interview. That was yeah. a hell of a, that, that was the most great pod. Most particularly. Yeah. So he was clearly demoted. So then you combine that climate change message with what is clearly a fuck you to the prairies in this. I mean, I just can't and, see it any other way. And British and, and British Columbia, the, 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 the largest non-renewable resource project in Canadian history is LNG, which is British Columbia. Okay. But they have I mean, a different vision. About, I mean, we're just talking about. Yeah, but it's oil and gas. Jenny. You can't say oil and gas and not not count let not count uh, the, the the project in uh, in British Columbia. So, yeah, no. My point was going to be about representation. My point was going to be that they dropped Jim Carr from the cabinet. The the position that the Manitoba member has is relatively junior, and then they give Randy Boisneau. Uh, they put one person in from Alberta, and they give them tourism. Um, so they did the minimal possible to address the representational issues in the prairies at a time when they are going to be going to war with the prairies on energy and climate policy. I, I can't see that as anything but deliberate. To the same way that you're talking about loading up Quebec, the electoral calculation is clearly... I don't know. Maybe Randy gets reelected again. Maybe not. I don't give a shit. We are going to try to win this thing through Quebec. That's how I saw it. Am I too hyperbolic about this? Am I too regionally sensitive about this? Well, well no, I think wearing I, a Rough I, I Riders jersey. No, I think you're. I think, I think you're right, but I, I don't think we can just say the prairies. Like as I said, um, I. LNG is a major, uh, is the, the biggest oil and gas project ever in Canadian history. And that is something that is uh, widely supported by the NDP government, the Horgan government in, uh, in British Columbia. Um, and if you look at Guy Beau's activism, it's not just oil and gas. This is a guy that's campaigned also against forestry. And uh, there's also a huge environmental component against hydroelectricity. So uh, in, if you look at uh, uh, Site C in uh, British Columbia, uh, guys like- No David nuclear Suzuki, fan either. 
not a nuclear fan either. So this is going to be very interesting. It'll be also interesting to see if this has any, um, uh, what the dynamic is going to be with um, uh, with Legault. Uh, Legault is now in election cycle. He gave a big kind of keynote speech uh, in, ter- in terms of getting ready for his election last week or the week before. And uh, the fact that it, 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 there have been such an elevation of Quebec ministers for the Liberals, you wonder, is this a message that there, are they going to, get, because Trudeau has been pretty deferential to Legault. And that, I think, had a lot to do with the election cycle. Is that going to continue? Or is this going to be, does he have Jolie? Does he have Rodriguez? Does he have Gibo? Does he have these guys go out and start to kind of like, you know, punch Legault in the nose a little bit leading into the election cycle and say, OK, you guys, uh, you guys, Legault, you you came out and you you endorsed Aaron O'Toole. And I still won the same amount of seats in Quebec and I'm still prime minister. So I'm going to be a bit of a thorn in uh, a thorn in your side. And even if Trudeau doesn't want to do it himself, he has very high profile ministers that can actually um, act as surrogates for that as well. So I think that's going to be an interesting dynamic, Scott, and David, when you talk about Quebec is is what, what dynamic is it going to play with the with the uh, with the current uh, the current government in uh, in the province? Not one fucking delicious tortier chance in hell is this government going to war with Legault. They are going to be on a mission. Those people are all going to be about working with Legault, telling everything at the center of the federal government to uh, engage with Legault. Um, they will look at the lesson of the election is that they did not establish a deep enough partnership that it was impossible for Legault to distance himself from it. And then he had the option of endorsing um, O'Toole. They're going to be doubly motivated uh to maintain because he's the king of quebec and he's going to remain the king of quebec uh, that that that's that's my guess i just do not see any chance there isn't a chance in hell that julie is going to take on lego lego uh, people i know in quebec think lego might be building toward a referendum there's inevitably going to be conflict um i think in that province it's smart of them to have a quebecer in charge of health i think because they're not going to live up to the province's demands on health care financing so they can at least debate that issue out um, effectively in the province, in the province of Quebec. But I, I don't think there's much doubt that we're headed towards some conflict with Quebec, unless, unless we have a federal government that is prepared to really just absent themselves from that kind of debate, which maybe we do. I think they are going to look uh, for uh, bows and arrows and cherubs and hearts. That is going to be their strategy, I think. We've been talking about the idiom, use it or lose it, the last little while. It's generally a truth in life. Think about aerobic conditioning, speaking another language, your vacation time. But when it comes to investing in Spectrum to digitally connect Canadians, especially rural Canadians, our presenting sponsor, TELUS, believes it should be a rock-solid principle. Here's a quick refresher. Spectrum is the radio waves that make your cell phone, GPS systems, and Wi-Fi work. You know, important stuff that helps you live. The federal government licenses Spectrum to companies who are expected to use it to provide service. TELUS is using their Spectrum all over rural Canada. In Wetaskiwin, expanded digital connectivity has allowed the self-proclaimed smallest city in Alberta to stay competitive throughout COVID-19. That means people can successfully run their businesses, access education and healthcare, so they can stay and thrive in Wetaskiwin. But that is not happening in way too many other rural communities in Canada. Their spectrum is controlled by regional carriers who think it's a better idea to squat on it and then resell it for millions in profit than actually use it to improve people's lives. The adjective regional does not mean small. These are multi-billion dollar companies who get billions in government spectrum subsidies. And the fact is they deploy less than 20% of the rural spectrum they hold. It's people who suffer. TELUS, on the other hand, has the strongest track record of deploying rural spectrum. Almost two-thirds of theirs is put to use, with more to come. Back to their principle. As a technology leader with a social purpose, TELUS believes you should use your spectrum or you should lose it. They are fully committed to doing the work in partnership with governments to help end the digital divide in this country. Go to telus.com slash connecting Canada to learn more. So Anita Anand is the defense minister. And it's being, I think, widely heralded. 
because of her evident competence um, and smarts in the way that she handled the vaccine procurement issue, both in terms of substantively and communication terms. So she's impressive. I don't, I'm not in any way taking away from that. But is she the right person for the challenge there at DND? Like, I'll just be confrontational with you and say, why is, like, I don't think they're going to respect her. And I don't, she's not going to be part of uh, their world. Maybe that's good. But on the other hand, couldn't a Bill Blair, who's run a police force, go in there and crack heads um, and get really behind what's going on there in a way that she might not be able to do? And by the way, what happened to Bill Blair? He got demoted. Why did he get demoted? Well, I think we, in terms of Anita and Anne, I think we have to see. I think that, you know, Sajin was part of that world and it didn't help him at all. Sometimes putting a subject matter or someone who comes from that, uh, from that universe is, is, uh, uh, is, is not the best thing because they have preconceived uh, notions as well. And I'm not sure how much the military would appreciate in the same regard. I'm not sure how much the military would appreciate a, a chief of police coming in and trying to tell them, uh, uh, tell them what to do. So I, I actually think that uh, we'll have to see how, how it works with an Anne, but I, I think that probably for uh, for what needs to happen uh, in terms of culture in the military, um, it might uh, it might not be bad to have someone that's completely from outside uh, outside the forces and is coming in with a complete new set of uh, a new set of eyes and a different perspective in terms of uh, of fixing some of the uh, fixing some of the problems they have. It may not work, but I, I don't think that. Uh, you know, I, I don't think the knocking heads or the uh, 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 or that that uh, that kind of focus has worked so far. It's every day. It just seems to be every few days. There's just another slow drip of someone being uh, someone being sure. uh, resigned or pushed out of the military for inappropriate behavior. And so I think we'll have to see we'll have to see how that kind of uh, how that kind of uh, works for her, works for the government. I, I'm closer to that point of view. And look, this may all be proven incorrect and. It may be that it's an un, uh, an undoable job. It may be that it's really, really, really hard uh, and will defy anybody's talents. But I I think there's a um, – and you didn't say this, David, so I'm not trying to lay this on you. But I think there's a – when you see people shorthand this discussion, they go, oh, well, you know, the military, you know, all these problems. So they're in for a shakeup. They need a shakeup. And so they brought her into shake. I don't think they need a shakeup. I actually think they need stabilizing. I think they need somebody that understands, like – how do you, they need somebody who understands systems and people. And they need to understand that this is a different kind of system, a different kind of department, a different kind of culture, all that kind of stuff than any other department in the government of Canada. It's extraordinarily unique. And I think she's shown her competence from a managerial perspective when it comes to managing procurement, right? Which is, you know, a department that failed many people. But she also has a governance background, right? Like she also, she, you know, has... I, I I'm guessing that she has a nose for culture and how to how to manage through that stuff, how to sort of what is an acceptable and doable level of reform and change to show incremental steps and to deal with these things. And I, I think that's the promise of her, the hope for her. Right. Is that that's where she'll do the um, that she isn't going to come in there as a scold. And go like, hi, I'm going to tell you people how it should be and like get in line or get lost. I think it's that she understands institutions and culture and governance and that she'll sort of you know try to find a way to make that place like that is a watch that doesn't tick properly so i i think her job is to um is to get in there and get the gears moving again do you have an idea why blair got demoted i i don't know i mean he's older i, I know that sounds shitty but like maybe it's just maybe Maybe they're maybe they observe energy levels, and I don't know. Uh, maybe needed a lighter lift. They featured well, him in their most well, effective ad in the election. Yeah. Yeah, but they, it, it became a narrative that what it wasn't like, like they were lucky that they turned the narrative against the conservatives, and that was partly helped by uh, Aaron's 
flip-flopping on the issue. But the fact of the matter is, is gun crime is up in the country and has been since the liberals took power. So, so objectively looking, it's not like, it's not like it's, it's it, any of, of the measures that the liberals have done have changed anything. They just, they were able to win a communications battle. It's not like they actually won uh, anything substantive over the policy war. So there, there is a difference. Maybe this government acknowledges that, that uh, uh, maybe that government acknowledges that that's the case, or maybe he just didn't like Bill Blair. He's not nearly as much fun to hang around than Marco Mendicino. <laughs> Maybe well, I love Marco and I hang around with Marco, but I think the bill would be pretty fun to hang around with too. Big old cop, <laughs> big as a water tower. I bet you you could put a beer away, a beer or two away. I think he'd be plenty fun to hang around with. And he would have some stories. Scott, I heard, I heard you say on CTV that you thought this was a big signal to the backbench that there was hope for upward mobility. I, I don't know. I may have said that early on when I was still tripping over my tongue and uh, incorrectly <laughs> identifying portions of the country. Um, I don't know. I'd say big, but I think it was something of a signal. I mean, remember, I thought that Joyce Marie's appointment was a was a reward to the backbenches. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, my 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 cup does not runneth over. Um, but I, I I do think you know like. If they, for, let me put it this way, if they had left Sean Fraser out, I think it would have been a real mistake. I also think that, you know, you can look at it as a caucus management issue in terms of uh, Mark Holland, but I think moving Mark Holland into House leadership, maintaining someone who has already immersed himself in House leadership as whip, you know, saying, let's keep that guy there. I mean, it, it didn't get a lot of discussion today, but House leader is such a vital play in the middle of a minority parliament. Um, so yeah, I think there were some signals to the backbench saying, look, you know what, we're, we're, you know what, if you do your work, uh, play your cards, uh, there's still hope. It isn't, it isn't, uh, it isn't a lost cause. It's important, man. Six right. years in people start to get like, you know, they start to make decisions about whether this is ever going to happen for them. And when they decide that it's never going to happen for them, they can get pissy. Yeah. What do you think about that, Jenny? Yeah, I, I agree with that to uh, I agree with that, that to a certain extent. And I think this government even more than uh, than past governments, both conservative or liberal, because we've seen so many we've heard so many stories out of this government that, you know, backbenchers that were talking about how they had, hadn't had a conversation with the prime minister in the first term they were in office or um, uh, so. You so cite I, that you cite that every pot. I'm not defying the point. I'm not. But literally, if we had a dollar for every pod that you raise that we could buy a good portion of uh, anything we wanted. <laughs> no, but it's true. <laughs> that's, that's, you back really to are C off your game I'm back today. to CTV. You're really off like, your just, game today. Jesus so, Christ, so I think that, mess. <laughs> I think I think Fuck. that uh, probably in terms of I think it probably did send a, a signal to the backbench, but I'm not sure how big a signal like we're in a minority government. So if you're sitting there and you think you're fifth and you're the fifth backbencher in line for the next cabinet position, I think it's pretty safe to say you're not getting in in this uh, parliamentary term unless you know, something catastrophic happens. So, you know, I think it was not, I think it was, it, it sends a good message that Frazier and Holland, uh, Holland were in, but I, I don't think that probably it's, uh, uh, it's going to be indicative of, uh, of uh, kind of future appointments because in a minority parliament, like unless something happens, we're not going to see a shuffle for, you know, a year and a half, two years. If not, this, this government has done less kind of rejigging or tinkering of cabinets than any government previously has in terms of of different uh, phases of uh, of government. So, um, you know, it's nice, you know, good for them, but I'm not sure how much it practically means for all the other, you know, poor names. So you're saying it might people. send the opposite signal. It might. I mean, like, I'm thrilled for Mark Holland, particularly because I really like Mark. Um, and uh, but you're saying it may send the opposite signal, which is if you didn't make the cut this time, you're probably fucked. It's possible. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can always run it through that filter, but I don't know. They all think they should be in, so their inclination to everybody believe always they thinks be in. they should. Uh, everybody always thinks they should be in. You know the way most of us were brought up. It's not polite to talk about your income, but most of us aren't publicly traded companies. Publicly traded companies have to talk about their bank accounts and regularly. Shareholders have the right to know a company's income down to the penny and what the top executives make, and how the company did relative to past performances. That way, they can make informed decisions on whether to hold stock, buy more, or sell. Well, our sponsor, CN, is one of the biggest publicly traded companies in Canada. 
and last Thursday it reported its financial results for the third quarter of the year. And as it turns out, CN did pretty well. Revenues were up impressively, and the market's judgment came quickly. CN's share price rose almost 9% by day's end. I've talked here before about CN's philosophy. It is, of course, committed to delivering a good return to its investors and top-notch service to its customers. But it also believes in patiently making investments in safety, in technology, and in capacity that in turn make it the railway of the future. CN's philosophy is one of growth. Its tracks span Canada and the United States. As the fragility of foreign supply chains becomes ever clearer, CN is betting that markets and governments will increasingly depend on rock-solid shippers and trade enablers like, well, CN. But CN also wants its investors to know it is not complacent, quite the opposite. The company recently launched a strategic plan designed to deliver immediate shareholder value and make the railway even more competitive in the months and years ahead. It has set sensible spending and earning targets for 2022 and is on the way to achieving them. Last week's Q3 reporting was a day of good news. There will be more. So what was the best decision that uh, Trudeau made about his cabinet? Tell me, let's go through, let's go do a round. What's the best decision he made in his cabinet? I think it's an N. I think it's an N. I think he had to get, I think, look, in terms of, uh, what's a positive play in terms of seizing the agenda and making things better going forward? Uh, it doesn't fit that bill. But in terms of saying, uh, I need to limit uh, the damage that continues to happen here. I need to give myself a new and better chance at managing this problem and have it stop being a perpetual problem. I think that the Anan appointment, and just and equally, to be blunt, and I don't mean to be unkind toward the guy, but you know, it's just as important that Sajin is out as she is in, right? Uh, maybe more so. Yeah. So I, I thought that was probably the most obvious decision. That um, yeah, I think Duplo at Health or Duplo at Health, uh, David, to your point, I think that um, uh, it, it, it's it's as kind of the pandemic has is wearing down from a health point of view, it is going to go more economic. They, they've got to pretend they're still doing the health stuff and what have you, but it is going to come down to that messaging. So I think that was probably smart in terms of a political decision uh, for him dealing with the uh, province of Quebec. I think the LeBlanc, uh, appointment for him. I'm saying if you're Trudeau, um, he's obviously very comfortable with uh, Dominic Dom has done all the kind of reach out to the provinces. He's has his established relationships uh, with all of uh, with all of the premiers. And now he's got uh, infrastructure, which I assume he would have had a bigger role before, but he was battling cancer during the last uh, swearing in. So so this is now that he's 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 back and healthy. Um, this gives him something that doves tail very, very close together in terms of infrastructure announcements as well as the intergovernmental stuff uh he's there as a resource uh to to make uh uh to make uh it, it's probably I, I hate to use the term security blanket but it's a comfort for trudeau to know that that uh uh the person kind of reaching out and doing the day-to-day -day, um uh back and forth with the premiers is someone that he obviously trusts implicitly yeah i was going to say Le, i was going to say dominic leblanc too um i was going to because you know catherine mckenna explained to me uh, that the government, the feds ceded so much to the provinces in terms of how infrastructure dollars get spent that you can't actually make the decisions in Ottawa. It's a and so it's going to it is a fed prof process to to get uh, to get infrastructure dollars spent, and you have to have good relations with the provinces because they provide the list of what projects could possibly be funded. So they might not include necessarily include your projects on their list. So it really is. A Fed Prov municipal negotiated process. I think it makes sense to combine it all in one, and I think it makes sense to combine it under him because he'll be good at that. So, worst decision, worst well, glaring error. What's the glaring error? Well, I don't think they made it as an error. I think a bad decision was uh, was obviously the Gibo Wilkinson uh, tandem. Wilkinson is is just as much uh, anti uh, resource development as uh, Gibo. He just uh, doesn't have the abrasiveness that um, that. Uh, uh, Gibo has. Um, I also think that uh, the appointment of Melanie Jolie will come back to bite him in the ass in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, foreign affairs. I'm not sure that she, she listen. She 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 clawed herself back up from uh, uh, from having uh, been demoted the last time. But she, you know, uh, from a political point of view, she went. Uh, 
uh, t- she, she fought for him uh, uh, during the election. She she was there uh, defending the liberal government, defending uh, Trudeau. So uh, so she gets a big promotion on that. But uh, it is a it is a p- pretty big portfolio. And, and in a lot of cases in Canada, um, uh, you only hear about the uh, foreign minister or foreign policy issues when uh, someone has stepped in it. So I, I think that that is an appointment that could come back uh, and bite him in the ass as well. Jenny, is it actually is it actually a prestigious job? Like, is it important? Like, doesn't the prime minister do this job? Like, you know, I've seen a lot, like, I mean, you know, P- Pierre Trudeau in his last term appointed two foreign affairs ministers. One was Mark McGuigan, who'd never been in the cabinet before. And then and then he put Alan McKechn there to put him out to pasture. When McKechn had blown himself up at finance, he put him out, he put him there to ease his transition into retirement. Like, I just don't know. But, you, you know, you, you two have been inside the government. I don't know how big a job that is. Um, it's seen, at least in our government, is always seen as a uh, as a big job. We always had heavyweights that were uh, that were foreign affairs ministers. And if you look at if you look at Garneau, he did uh, uh, play a significant role in files. He was uh, he he was he was front and center in terms of when the two Michaels uh, were released. And it was him and uh, uh, mostly Marco Mendicino with uh, Sajan playing a supporting role in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the Afghanistan uh, portfolio. So I think that uh, this government has shown, at least in the past, that it is something that they look at um, as a substantive uh, as a substantive policy uh, department. Yeah, and you're right that the I don't prime know, every minister- time I saw Garno interviewed, it looked to me like he wasn't quite sure what to say because he maybe hadn't didn't have the latitude to say what he thought. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that possibility, uh, or uh, that he had conflicting thoughts, um, which maybe. I mean, first of all, let's just talk about Garneau for a moment, right? Like, I mean, it, it's kind of a dramatic event today. Like, you know, within the relative world of politics, it was sort of weird. Like, I think there's a parallel universe uh, in which my idea made for a better day for Trudeau. And my idea was like, hey, if you're not pointing the guy to cabinet, if he's going to get, I don't know, the rumors he's going to get punted off to Paris or whatever, which, by the way, is not exactly the worst fate in the world. Um <laughs> But if you're going to you're going to clear out a month after the election, you're going to clear out NDG Westmount. Um, why? Why wouldn't you why wouldn't you surprise the whole world and appoint a superstar? Like if you if at some point over the last four or five weeks, you either decided or events unfolded such that Garneau wasn't going to be remaining in that seat. Why wouldn't you say, you know how I can jolt this government, and jolt this whole thing? I can bring in somebody else and say, this person's going to be my candidate in NDG. I'm going to call the by-election soon. And I'm going to put them into cabinet right away. Um, what why unfolded have, there? But why would he have him run? Like if it, if, if it was if if you know Trudeau had if Trudeau had any thoughts that he wanted to put some fresh blood in and and that in, involved or Garneau or Garneau saying this is my last run and they they're like okay well Paris is open and we're going to appoint him there why not just it's it's uh, it's it's a safe seat for the Liberals uh, why I, I, why I'm not assuming, just have him I'm assuming it's a post election phenomenon it doesn't make sense otherwise something's happened since. October, uh, September 20th, that that led to him no longer being in cabinet, right? Well, it's it, it's what happens when you have 35 days between or 36 days between uh, the election and appointing your cabinet. So what I th- the appointment that I'm at least there's rumors, at least for for Garneau, um, everyone that's saying, oh, he was dropped and everyone then pipes up and says, oh, he's going to Paris. It's become over the course, like Scott, the four hours. Well, better on- happen. Yeah, well, it, yeah, but over the course of the four hours that we were on TV, it became like a like we all just talked about yeah. it as he was already was appointed fact. to the ambassador. The 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 one let leave out where we've heard nothing is Bartis Chegger. She was she was completely uh, uh, bounced from cabinet and and no understanding as uh, as to uh, as to why. Nary a word. And I don't don't force me to speculate on what might change in government policy as a consequence of that. <laughs> but can i sorry you know what i took us off track with the garneau thing um which i do think is a super interesting little behind the scenes something or the other that we don't fully understand yet but you asked what was the worst decision and i think yeah. the worst decision isn't being more aggressive uh like we talked about all the different people and all that sort of stuff but i think maybe the worst decision wasn't a, a personnel decision it was an organizational decision he stuck the word housing into a minister's title but it's not obvious to me that there is a mandate. We'll see what the mandate letters are. But it looks to me like it's the same. He was going to keep – he had those responsibilities already, actually, in his old portfolio. But really the way that it's structured, right, 
housing policy, you know, it's kind of half finance, half that social ministry because the CMHC and all that. Like if I think if you're saying, I want to demonstrate to people that I'm attentive to these issues, like housing, which came up constantly during the campaign, affordability, which is either a subset or a parallel issue to housing, right? Like if you said, like, I care about this and I want to actually lead on this, and I think there's political juice in that, regardless of whether we say it's a provincial issue, you would have announced a standalone ministry. You would have said, we're going to, we're going to pull some parts together here and actually do something with this. Um, and I think they're missing a bit of an opportunity there. But but that's to your point. Yeah, of, that might have uh, created expectations that something would happen, though. Yeah, well, this, this is, Scott, to your point, this is the devil's going to be in the mm -hmm. details of the mandate letter. Because what does that mean? Because there's two very different th things that a housing ministry could mean. You, you've got affordable housing and social housing, which the government would work on with the two other two levels of government in terms of uh, building affordable which housing. Which is what it means. Um, because it's the same minister. Well, but, but that's but that's not the issue of affordability or housing that, that people talked about during the election. And so during the election, the, this is this would then be putting pressure on mostly municipal governments from from stop the NIMBY policies to to be able to let let there be uh, let there be building more of a supply. Because that's that's ultimately the problem we have is the, the the there is such a demand for housing and there's such limited supply. And that's a lot to do with uh, municipal uh, municipal uh, uh, policy. So so it could be. It it could be a, uh, a setting uh, setting Hussein up to fall, fail because uh, I think everyone I think what they tried to preposition and what they were trying to say is that it was the latter it was the the concern that Canadians had during the election and it's probably going to become a very evident that uh, um, evident that that's not the case and then you come into this whole like if we see how overarching Gibo decides to take the environment and climate change policy because because it would be the most pervasive policy or pervasive uh, uh, department next to Revenue Canada it's like. And he could like literally wedge himself into like every decision. And we have heard that he has done that in previous cabinet discussions, even as Canadian Heritage, where he's like, you know, going around and knocking on cabinet ministers doors to try to pressure them in on, on environmental stuff. So we'll see if he gets down to the granular issue of, you know, uh, uh, trying to uh, trying to fight with municipalities to ensure that, uh, you know, no more uh, no more homes are built and uh, uh, and what have you. So it's the, the the if I was Hussein today, I would be like going, Jesus, what's my mandate letter going to look like? This is this is not a good day for me. <laughs> Hopefully it's the convening function that John Webster talked about. Hopefully it's the federal government bringing all the relevant players together to try to get something moving, try to get something I, moving and, you know, obviously put some financial incentives on the table or something. I've humped that idea with everybody I can talk to since John proposed that. I mean, I know that it is a process idea, but it just seems to me to be a smart way for the federal government to say, look, you know, we have all these NIMBY policies. We want to sort of balance, you know, maintain a green belt, but also generate supply. How are we going to do this? Let's put some people together in a room and force people to say, you know what, there are some overriding national priorities with some regional variation. But, you know, and that's what I think it could have been. So that's why I think it was a disappointment, because I think that people are anxious for that and they're anxious for it right in their wallet. And that's going to matter come the next vote. Okay. Just to finish off, I say the glaring error is what I referred to earlier, which is the deliberate minimalistic representation given uh, the the prairies, given what little they had to work with, they did the least they could possibly do. Newf Newfoundland it. has the Newfoundland has the same amount of uh, seats like around the cabinet as the prairies do. do. Newfoundland and Labrador. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Also, an energy. All right, we got to get quick because we've been, we've been, we, our time is flying by. We got a few things we want to do. Fly. So, flying by, flying by. Our our clipping segment. Let's cut this really short. The, the good gray Globe and Mail. The good gray Globe and Mail, which used to re refer to people by their honorific titles and sentences and things <laughs> like that, had the term "butt dial" on the front page this past week. Butt dial on the front page of the Globe and Mail. And it's all about this Rogers story. Oh, my God. Uh, so, and everybody knows what's, everybody who's following knows what happened after after that. As you read that, because we've all had, you know, when, you, when you're working <laughs> at the speed you're working in politics, you can make the odd mistake. I have some reply alls that haunt me to this day. Um, but you ever had anything like that happen to you where... You blew something up on a on a butt dial or some equivalent. I sent emails before where you've sent them and then you go back and you're looking for something and you realize, you know, you've typed in a name and then you pressed 
enter thinking you've got one person mm-hmm. and you actually send uh, send the other. We we had this wasn't me, but uh, we had someone leading into um, leading into the budget, which would have been the budget of 2010, I think it was. Um, we had someone accidentally. So um, Kevin, uh, I'm going to get the names. So Kevin McCarthy worked uh, for Flaherty, and then there was a Kevin MacArthur who worked, I think, for the Globe. I, I might be getting the last names mixed up. Either way, uh, one of our people in our comm shop sent all of like their suggested revisions to the budget speech uh, to the Globe and Mail, as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to uh, the uh, finance uh, staff. We could. First of all, I want to get due notice to Alexandra Pazatsky. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. She's the telecom part uh, reporter at the Globe who wrote that story, and she's been killing it on this Roger story. And it is a juicy burger to bite into two, three times a day. It's given up good <laughs> stuff. Um, it's been such a wicked story to follow. Um, I don't follow anybody on Twitter but Martha anymore. That's right. Just Martha. I don't need your yeah. PR firms and your spin. <laughs> I'm going to run this hot rod straight up your ass, Ed. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's fucking, it's phenomenal. Um, but, like, what a sorry situation. Um, I We could do an entire pod on on these kinds of fuck ups that I've authored. Um I've just I've been at the center of many of these, but I will actually draw on the same sort of example you guys are using. One of the, I think the worst 7 seconds I've ever had in my life was the 7 seconds that followed me hitting send on a keyboard and it was actually not when we were in government. It was in that weird remember David that weird interregnum where after Paul got fired from cabinet, yes, I will continue to assert that he was fired from cabinet because he was. So he's fired from cabinet. But before Chrétien steps down, we know that, you know, event, we, you know, all things being equal, you know, Paul's going to be the next prime minister. But, you know, and I'm kind of in exile. I'm working in consulting and because I'm no longer in government, I'm in consulting. And one of the things that I'm doing is I've been hired by the Department of Industry, as it was then, to doing some work on foreign direct investment. We're doing this file and it's going very frustrating. And Brian Tobit has been brought in as the new minister, but he's been brought in from Newfoundland by Chrétien to be a counterweight to Paul, a potential future rival, right? And so there's all these politics and I'm going over to the, you know, and I got a big black mark on me because I'm going over into in industry and doing these meetings and we go to them and I'm really frustrated. And I did something I'd never done in my entire life. I literally have never done this before or since because I don't have these methodological, um, methodical uh, uh, traits. Um, I sat down after a meeting. I was so frustrated. And I wrote a note to file. So I write this note to file and I just let it all rip, right? <laughs> like I just go crazy, right? I'm like, the woman who's in charge of the file is uh, an expert and she thinks a bunch of stupid things and she's scared of her boss. And then, you know, obviously Tobin's sticking his fingers in here and the guy, uh, the, the DM is a fucking idiot and blah, 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 blah. And Manly still got his hands in this and the whole thing. I read all this shit out, make myself feel a lot better. I figured it all out. I put together a universal field theory and then boof, instead of like, I send it to the woman who in charge of the file over the industry <laughs> and for seven seconds i look at my computer and i'm like is it possible i've sent it to her have i done that and i don't know if you remember this but i think it was you david i called in to my office and i said i think i think i've done i think i've done this thing and i think <laughs> i can't make it i can't send one of those <laughs> please please return email <laughs> those, you know, those things right those always work so I'm just like sitting there going like, do I, do I call her? Do I, do I, do I ignore it? Do I, do I buy a boat and, and sail the Pacific for the next decade? Like, what do I do with myself? And eventually she did call me about it. And she said, I thought this was really fascinating. It was super interesting insight as to how your brain works. I had no idea all that. And wow, that was really interesting. And I'm like, yeah, but I called you dumb and awful and, you know, all sorts of other things. Well, you know, it was really interesting. Gave me a lot of insight. Yeah. That contract get renewed, Scott? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. But that was Tobin's fault, not mine. <laughs> Brian was out to get us for a while. Then he came on board. All right. Jenny, before we go, and you don't have to, it's all right. Why would I say it to you? You too. <laughs> Before we go, there's one last thing we have to talk about, which is 
the conservative policy on MP vaccines. They're, O'Toole is in quicksand here. O'Toole is uh, disappearing beneath the goddamn surface. And I once asked the question on this pod about why they didn't have Leslin Lewis out more publicly <laughs> speaking on behalf of the party. We may have learned the answer to that question this week. Um, so <laughs> what, what is, how are they going to fucking resolve this? Because it's grim. Yeah, well, listen, I, I think that probably Aaron's happy today. The cabinet swearing in. It's the first day we haven't had uh, we, we haven't had a change in what our uh, what our what our position is. This is listen, it's not just what the position is. It's 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 the handling. Some, sometimes uh, the handling of things makes the actual issue, uh, uh, the actual issue worse. And depending on between Aaron changing his position and different uh, uh, different uh, MPs out there talking uh, in, in, in on on different sides. It's, this is this is this is kind of caucus management 101, and this is where he's uh, uh, that that I think is almost more problematic for Aaron than the actual policy in terms of uh, uh, in terms of vaccinations. You're not looking like a leader. That's the problem. That's that's fundamental issue with this, right? Is like from a political standpoint, the fundamental issue is he's weak and he looks weak. And this issue exposes the extent of the weakness. He says something, he can't back it up. He therefore has to eat it a day later. Leslie Lewis can say whatever she wants. She can cram any shit she wants down his throat and he can't say anything except tastes great. So he is in a big, big problem. I think it's exposed what a weakling he is. And it's one thing that people don't like. It's a weak leader. Yeah, well, okay, so we got to wrap up. Gordon, would you please assemble the troops for our weekly Hey You, please? Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The Hey You's are about to begin. All right, I'm going to give you guys a second to think about it. I'm going to go first. My Hey You this week, my Hey You this week goes out to whoever, and I don't know the person. Whoever leaked that story about Ed Rogers and Messiah Jury <laughs> is a fucking genius. That was a <laughs> knife through the goddamned abdomen, and Ed Rogers is still bleeding out from that attack. He may have the high-powered PR guys on his side, but the other side sent a torpedo through his hull. I fucking loved that story. My God, that gave whole new life to the thing. Okay, so whoever you are, Hey, you, you kicked ass. <laughs> <laughs> Props to Christine Dobby and Doug Smith for breaking that story in the star. That was fun. Well, my, right. my, hey, you is going to go to the conservatives. So uh, uh, you've now been, uh, you can look at the Gibo appointment. I think it's horrifying for Canada. And I think from a practical point of view, uh, the activist side of what he wants to do is actually just impractical because we, as, as much as I think most people agree that eventually we are going to be in, uh, uh, in uh, renewable uh, energy sources, we're not anywhere close. People, it's going into winter, people need to heat their homes uh, and the windmills and solar, windmills and solar pa panels aren't going to cut it. So at the end of the day, from a practical point of view, regardless of what the government announces, not only from a, because people need to heat their homes uh, to fill their cars up with gas, um, uh, they also, the government also needs the tax revenue from that too, because of course we have a $1.3 trillion debt. So so I'll, as horrifying it is for uh, uh, Canada that Stephen Gibault has been appointed the environment minister, conservatives, look at this as a gift horse. This is, this is the economic policy that this government is going to hang its hat on. And uh, at a time when uh, inflation is at, uh, at a high, at a 20 year high, uh, and at a time when people are paying, play, paying a record uh, a record amount to fill up their cars uh, with gas, that pretty soon they're going to have to be, whether it's oil or whether it's natural gas, uh, heat their homes. So I think that look at this as an opportunity. This is the economic policy that this federal liberal government is going to hang its hat on. And you guys need to be there uh, to hold them to account. Jenny, what's the price of chicken fingers in Vernon, B.C.? <laughs> <laughs> it's up. Chicken is up everywhere. It's up. It's up. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, you got to hate you. Goddamn plum sauce is almost impossible to get now. <laughs> um, 
My my hey you is to uh, lazy analysis, and uh, nothing exposes lazy analysis like a di- day like today. If I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody saying, "Well, you know, obviously the prime minister is looking at this as his last term, and he's going to be resigning, he's going to be retiring," and so he set up Jolie, you know, in order to like, uh, oh, another strong woman who could be a leadership contender and all this. I think there is just it's the lowest form of analysis to say, oh, you know, Trudeau's on his way out and therefore that's what all this means and they just dust off everything. Everything is through that. It's just lazy. It's dumb. It's uninformed. There isn't a single fucking clue that exists objectively that the prime minister of the country wishes to forfeit this job so that he could go do what? Some other shittier job. No. So I, I just, I, I get really frustrated when I hear people just going, well, you know, obviously you can see in this choice that it's another indication the prime minister is setting up. And, you know, it's just, I, I just hear it all day long, every day. And I just think it is, it is the most mail it in, sit around the bar at the Metropolitan kind of analysis that you can get. And it just sucks. So do better. Excellent. Agree with everybody. Agree with everybody on the hey use this week. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you both. Uh, You worked hard today. Full value. Canadians are full value for your service. Thank you for your service to the country today. You too. Um, A lot like a soldier, really. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye. Be happy till then. Bye. All right. Wait a second. I'm supposed to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. And I should thank all the accursed out there who waited patiently for this show to come out later than normal today. Thank you very much for your patience, and we'll be back at our regular time next Tuesday.